Right. Welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Sebu David Alsamian. I'm the uh, inaugural director of the Armenian Studies program here at the Promise Armenian Institute. I'm also a professor of history and the holder of the Richard Ovanissian Chair of Modern Armenian History. It is my distinct pleasure today to welcome an old friend and a fellow colleague and scholar, Vasken Davidian, to give a talk on an Armenian uh, artist uh, who's, who flourished in the Ottoman Empire in the 19th, late 19th and early 20th centuries. And before I introduce and say a few words about Vasken himself, I'd like to just say two or two, a couple of things regarding the importance of this kind of work and trying to put it in a larger context of Armenian history and how we perceive the past as a Armenians to the extent that we identify as importantly as Armenians and also as scholars of Armenian issues. And that is that Vaskin's talk on this particular artist, I think is important because among other things, it breaks uh, away from this traditional approach to Armenian history that has given us really a, quite a limited and uh, elite level history from the top, seen from a from perspective of diplomats, amiras, a, uh, um, state, uh, statesmen, and so forth, as opposed to uh, a myriad of other actors who have gone largely unnoticed and silenced in Armenian history. And among this category of a myriad of actors, one must definitely include Armenian artists, and particularly the topic of these Armenian artists that Vaskin is interested in, and that is uh, members of what could be called the Armenian subaltern class within the larger Ottoman uh, context. That is to say, people who had barely enough power to even inscribe their names on the surface of time. But in our case, they were fortunate enough to have merited the attention of Armenian artists who, port who portrayed them in their artwork and so on, and there, thereby uh, made their lives somewhat perceptible to us. And so for that reason, I think the talk tonight is a really interesting one, I can say in advance, having seen the topic of Vaskin's paper and having talked about it with him many years back. I've known Vaskin for at least 20 years now, one of the first times I met him was in London, and we talked about his top his interest in doing this kind of work that deals with history from below, the history of neglected individuals and actors and agents of uh, the Armenian past. And more often than not, as I remember from our conversation back then, our focus has been, let's say, on Constantinople or Istanbul and on the top level of Armenian society, neglecting this entire uh, substratum of uh, life that goes on when one opens the trap door of history and looks down and sees what ordinary people do. So in this sense, Vaskin's approach, uh, which is to a large extent based on biographical uh, retellings of the past through the prism of artists and so on, I think breaks new ground in, in the larger context of this uh, sort of top-down level of approach to Armenian history. So Vasken Davidian, now I will give you a proper introduction to him, is an associate faculty member at the Faculty of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies, formerly known as the Oriental Institute at the University of Oxford. He defended his doctoral thesis in art history entitled Image of the Bantukht Amal of Constantinople. Uh, colon, late 19th century representations of migrant workers from the from Ottoman Armenia at Birbeck College at the University of London in 2019. He is with Boris Ajemian, uh, the co-editor of the journal Études Arméniennes Contemporaines, published by the Bibliothèque Nubach in Paris. The author of several articles, Vasken is currently working on the monograph uh, provisionally titled Art, Realism, and the Politics of Social Reform, colon, Reading Late 19th Century Visual Representations of the Armenian Hammal of Constantinople. 
based in part on his doctoral dissertation. So without further ado, please welcome me in giving Vaskin a round of applause. And thank you, Vaskin, for accepting our invitation to, uh, to teach us today about your, your work. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So I'm really, really grateful for the introduction. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm grateful to the Armenian Studies Center at the Promise Institute for organizing this hybrid lecture um, and the UCLA Richard Hovannisian Endowed Chair in Modern Armenian History and the UCLA Center for Near East Studies for co-sponsoring it. Um, above all, I'm grateful to uh, Professor Sebo Aslanian for his introduction, as well as for his kind invitation and for ensuring that this talk actually does take place. So um, this has been postponed several times due to COVID. And uh, in a way, it's a good thing because um, had I sort of turned up earlier, I would have talked about something completely different. Um, talking about um, Simon Hagopian, um, in a way, is, 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 a, is, a, is a journey sort of back for me because um, coming across uh, this particular biography on page uh, 247 and 248 uh, in Theotix Amenundaret Sutsa, Everyone's Almanac, in 1912, published in 1912, was basically the starting point. It was a eureka moment for me, which sort of sparked my entire PhD sort of project. So um, seeing that image, uh, uh, Hamas on a bridge at Karakoy, um, suddenly sort of made me realize that this was realism in the visual arts. And um, at high school, Melkonian in Cyprus, we basically told that realism was only a literary movement. So um, this image showed that it wasn't just a literary movement. There was definitely a visual sort of aspect um, to the whole thing. So, um, and also um, over the years, I sort of realized, okay. do I need to yes. press something? If you're, are there visuals ah. that we need to receive? Wonderful, thank you very much, that one. Thank you. We've done this before, so, um, and um, uh, so that's that's basically it. It's it's um, the way I'm. The reason I'm really really interested in doing this again is that um, when I first um, came across uh, Simon Hagopian and that particular painting um, in the biographical text by Teotique, um, I hadn't quite sort of worked out sort of the wider context, etc. Et so um, I published my first academic article on this particular topic in 2014. And my very first sort of workshop presentation in 2013 was about that particular sort of painting. But again, sort of at that time, you don't really sort of think about the wider context. So I hope that sort of I'll be dealing with um, the wider issues, the larger sort of pictures um, sort of today. So um, let's start the presentation. So the following presentation shall focus on a single brief biographical note um, running just over a page and a half of the notable, but now mainly forgotten, late Ottoman Armenian artist and art teacher, Simon Hagopian. Published in the 1912 edition of Teotig's Everyone's Almanac, Amenun Daret in Constantinople. As you can see on the screen, uh, the biography comprises of, firstly, a text component, which counts no more than 240, 250 words, and uh, provides basic information of the artist's date and place of birth, his education and training, a list of his notable works, awards, and closes with a quote by the artist. Secondly, two reproductions provide an image component. Um, these are made up of a photographic portrait of the artist in profile, um, and a grainy black and white reproduction of a painting of a group of four porters in mid-conversation on the Galata Bridge on the European side of Constantinople. To the student of Ottoman Armenian art and cultural production, material such as the above mentioned biography of Simon Hagopian, however sparse, is invaluable. In the absence or inaccessibility of archives and archival materials, including in the case of the art historian, visual material objects such as paintings, one does not have the luxury of leaving any stones unturned. Whereas art historians researching, for example, Dutch still lives or, or the French Impressionists or the British Pre-Raphaelites can have easy access to institutions, museums, galleries, and meticulously organized archives such as the Reich Museum, the Musée d'Orsay, or the British Library, etc. Scholars of the history of painting in the late Ottoman period, especially of the material culture of the Ottoman Armenians, have very few, almost no places to turn to. 
In the absence of such repositories, and especially considering what has been lost during the genocide and post-genocide periods, the excavation, documentation, and critical and analytical assessment of the art historical production of Ottoman Armenian artists, the subject of my own academic interest, an archive in print, such as the vast pool of information contained within the cumulative body of Teotic's almanacs, becomes crucial in one's quest for fragments of information, images, and texts to help us reassemble and reconstruct a view of the intellectual, social, cultural, and political environment within which these artists lived and worked, and the context in which cultural artifacts were conceived, produced, circulated, and received. So this presentation will reread Hagopian's uh, biography, both the images and the text, with the aim of doing just that. How does one pick up the bare bones provided in source materials, such as these brief biographical notes, a collection of bullet points really, masquerading as sentences, and squeeze every last bit of information from those images and the 240, 250 words in print in order to rethink the life and circumstances of a once respected Ottoman Armenian artist and art teacher, but crucially, to be utilized alongside other sources to expand outwards in order to reflect upon the wider environment of late Ottoman Constantinople and the wider empire. How does one assess the accuracy um, of the information therein and hence their reliability? So before moving to the biography, allow me to briefly introduce Theotic's Almanac series, the very archives in print, which have ensured the availability, the availability of this material to the interested scholar, so that we can also think about the context within which the biography itself had appeared. A very popular publication the celebrated Amenundare Tsuitsa, Everyone's Almanac, was published annually between 1907 and 1929, with an, inter with an interval of almost four years during the genocide years and their immediate aftermath. Its co-editors and co-founders were the Constantinople writer and publisher Teotoros Lapjinjian, better known sim simply as Teotig, and his wife, the writer and intellectual Asha Gui Teotig. Um, we normally refer to the um, Teotics Almanac as uh, Teotics in the singular Almanac, but there were two Teotics. There was a Mr. and there was a Mrs. Teotic, and our Shagui is often overlooked, and, and that is completely wrong because she was a, um, the Almanacs would not have been produced without her, and she was an intellectual in her own right. So um, when I say the te uh, te Teotics Almanac, it's, it's in the plural. So. So it's 19 volumes, um, totaling more than eight and a half thousand plus pages, comprise a veritable compendium that provides to this day an unrivaled archive imprint of the late Ottoman and immediate post-Ottoman Armenian experience in every conceivable field. Thinking of these volumes as almanacs in the traditional sense of the word, its etymology suggests either a Greek or Arabic origin for calendars or lists of data would be misleading, as such a view only provides an incomplete and reductive picture of their breadth and ambition and their achievement. I would argue that the Teotig's Almanac is much more than merely an informative resource of empirical data. To the scholar, when read closely, it also opens a window into its editors and into its hundreds of contributors' worldviews. Crucially, its longevity from 1907 to 1929 provides unparalleled insights into evolving zeitgeists and perspectives, and the Teotic's engagements with and responses to events and the at times dramatically changing world around them. To the student of the Ottoman Armenian art historical experience, such as me, for whom the general uh, for whom the general absence of accessible archives is a constant, these almanacs constitute an irreplaceable body of images and texts where the art historian is able to track down, trace, and discover the names and biographical details of and view reproduction of works by forgotten or often unknown artists. Furthermore, the historian can use this material to consider how the different conditions under which different editions of the almanac were produced have affected or determined what is included and what is left out, often in acts of self-censorship, and also the manner in which it is presented. In order, in order to grapple with this last question and the vast body of material involved, published under different sensorial and political regimes and socioeconomic conditions, I have begun to apply a loose periodization with which to approach and to better understand the content of the 19 editions of the Almanac. So this was the subject of a talk I gave um, yesterday, last night at the uh, University of California in Irvine. 
By periodization, I mean the organization of loose groupings of periods to reflect the and highlight the differing above mentioned um, conditions under which the various editions were published. Loose is also a key word here. These marked uh, periods um, very often gently and sometimes imperceptibly bleed into each other, catching the reader off guard. In summary, this practices um, uh, the following sort of rationale. First seeing the light of day in Constantinople in 1907, under, under the strict sensorial regime of um, Abdul Hamid II's final year, final years, um, I call this the first period. The Almanac continued publication into the more liberal environment of the second constitutional period, the second period. And it is during this period in 1912 that the Simon Hagopian biography was published, where one comes across a more outspoken tone and the inclusion of content that would have been considered seditious by the ancien regime of the Sultan. It was because of such content that Teotig was caught out by the gradual illiberal tightening of censorship under the Itihad Veteraka regime after 1913 and was sentenced to prison for one year in 1915. It is a strange um, circumstances of, this, of his imprisonment that saved him from the mass gathering of Armenian intellectuals on April the 11th, 24th, according to the new calendar. Yet he wasn't spared. Following his release, he too was arrested and spent the remaining years of the genocide and World War I years in exile. Against all odds, he survived. He was rescued and spent years in hiding in the Anatolian interior. And the story of his survival is, is in itself a, a fascinating story. Um, but upon, upon his re return to Constantinople, now under British occupation, Teotig immediately set about the resumption of the publication of the Almanac. Unsurprisingly, it had been suspended during, this, uh, during these years, taking advantage of the free press environment of the armistice years, which I think of as the third period. Teotig assembled a smaller issue, 1916 to 1920, after his return, and from then on continued publishing as regularly as before. By 1922, with the advance of the Turkish nationalist armies under Mustafa Kemal and the burning of Smyrna, things looked increasingly precarious for the remnants of the Ottoman Armenian population, now assembled mainly in Constantinople. Yet by January 1922, Ashagui had passed away of TB in Lausanne in Switzerland, and by 1923, Teotik had joined the thousands of exiles in the final dispersion and ended up in exile first to Corfu, then Nicosia in Cyprus, and finally Paris, where he passed away in 1928. All editions from 1924 onwards uh, were published in exile, which I call the fourth period, with a 1929 edition published in Paris posthumously. Simon Hagopian's biography was published in 1912 during the more liberal environment of the second constitutional period. Um, that's the second period that I just mentioned, just before a short-lived relatively liberal censorial regime would shift calamitously towards a more autocratic and arbitrary direction. Yet this is a particularly interesting time in the publication of the Almanac, because it was at this moment that the Teotics began to engage with Ottoman Armenian artists in a more serious and systematic manner. The 1911 edition is especially important in that it marks the beginning for the systematic use of biographies, which often include photographs as well as previously unpublished samples of work, poems, short stories, quotes, paintings, or sketches. A Hagopian's biography is a case in point. From an art historical perspective, the content of the 1912 edition in which Hagopian's biography appears is particularly impressive. The cover, an allegorical um, image that the Teotics had commissioned from the Constantinople artist Stepan Agayan, um, sets the scene. So we've got the cover there. Um, and we um, have um, some examples of, of some of the pages um, which deal with the art historical material. So in lieu of a, pre of a preface, Teotig reproduces a calligraphic work by the renowned teacher and calligrapher Khachik Tartajan, captioned Namush Hai Kerakutian, a sample of Armenian um, calligraphy, which is the image that you see right in the middle. For the first time, an entire new section, part four, um, entitled Hayashkar Keralvesti of Keralvesti Mater, Armenian World, Fine Arts, and people in the fine arts has been created. In this section, pages 229 to 276 are devoted to the arts, among which the visual arts and especially painting are the most prominent, with references to at least 16 artists. 
As already mentioned, the Theotic's preferred method to present this material was via the use of short biographies and the reproduction of images, such as photographs of the artists or reproductions of paintings or sketches. However, such images were also published independently. See, for example, um, slide five, for example, it, it, that's, it's, um, um, we have two biographies here of sort of forgotten artists. The first one is Abraham Sakayan, who was a major artist um, in the middle part of the 19th century, uh, Constantinople, and Jacques Damat, who is um, relatively unknown, or completely unknown. So uh, this is a typical example of the way the theoretics um, reproduce their biographies. So we've got the photograph of the artist, and we've got um, an example of, of one of the artists of the paintings. And um, we have um, biographies of better known artists like um, Charles Atamian, um, Arsen Shabanyan, and uh, Panos Telemezian, who is probably one of the better known, um, most famous Armenian artists of the early part of the 20th century. So um, this is the way that Teotics, um sort of collect the material and, and reproduce it on the pages of the almanacs. Agopian's biography of a similar length and following a very similar structure to the above follows almost immediately after. So before moving on to Hagopian's biography, let me point out that a decade later, in 1922, Teotihuacan also published a brief obituary of Hagopian, who had passed away the previous year in 1921. And in the middle, you see the obituary again, uh, reproducing an image by uh, Simon Hagopian himself. On this occasion, the reproduction of another painting by Hagopian, the beggar dervish in the yard of the Yeni Jami in Iskudar, was reproduced alongside the text. Teotic explains that Hagopian had presented him with a print of the painting in 1911. This might suggest that Hagopian may have given the Teotics more than one image when submitting his biographical information, and that a choice had been made by Teotic, the artist, or both, as to which image to use. Let us now turn to Hagopian's biography and engage with the images before turning our glance to the text. The round studio photographic portrait by an undisclosed photographer which appears on page 247, is a pretty standard, rather flattering image of the artist, handed out by Hagopian. Uh, this is the only photograph we have of the artist. We know that we know what he looks like because of this particular reproduction um, in the almanac itself. We've already mentioned uh, in passing the inclusion of the grainy black and white reproduction of the painting referred to in the caption as Turkish Hamas on the Karakou Bridge, and in the text as passing Hamas on the Karakoy Bridge, its selection suggests that perhaps both artist and publisher agreed that this painting, rather than the above mentioned dervish image or any other, was either representative of the artist's work or one of his most accomplished. And also, I just want to point out that engaging with a grainy reproduction of a painting on the page of an almanac and, and engaging with an actual painting itself are completely two different sort of experiences in terms of, of seeing the brush strokes, color, uh, size, etc. So we're really, really lucky to actually have the um, um, a photograph of the painting itself. It took me about 18 months to actually track it down, and I found it in the um, uh, entrance hall of a 90 year old um, carpet seller in Paris who wouldn't let me have a look at it, but I persevered and I drove him completely mad and eventually he gave me one hour to sort of have a look at it. And I managed to bring it down to 300 photographs of the painting. And I decided that if none of these photographs work, then I shouldn't really become an art historian mm -hmm. at all. So. Um, this was really, really sort of a big thing. This was really the starting point of my PhD. So, um, Hamas on the bridge at Karakuri represents a scene in which four instantly identifiable rural mi uh, migrant workers, um, Hamas by trade, have been captured mid-conversation while at rest by a timber structure, a rest station at the center of the Galata Bridge. In this contemporary and familiar scene, um, one that Hagopian would have passed by daily, the men, neither posing nor arranged pleasingly by the artists to adhere to Western academic uh, com compositional conventions, have been rendered with great naturalism. Positioned at the heart of the modernizing megalopolis on the landmark structure that links the old city uh, to the dynamic commercial hubs of Karakoy and Galata, 
in the upscale port of Pera, all in the European part of Constantinople. The men are presented as if in an ambivalent space, with the city's skyline conjured through a band of hazy brush strokes. Only a suggestion of the unmistakable outline of the Galata Tower is easy, easily sort of discernible. You can see him right over the sort of head um, of, the, of the man on, the, on that side. Um, this is a modern image of its time and place. Its modernity is signified by the meticulously rendered ornate ironwork of the bridge's balustrade, the latest achievement of modern British engineering, and is underscored by the consciously photographic frame employed by the artist. Consider the striking similarity of the frames adopted by Hagopian in his Hamals on the Bridge and the British photographer and illustrator René Ball uh, in his photographic image, Carriers Resting, reproduced in the London illustrated newspaper Black and White on the 2nd of January, 1897. What had been Hagopian's inspiration that led to such a framing of the image? We don't know whether he reproduced the scene from a photographic image, a common practice employed by uh, several of his contemporaries, or sketched it in situ. Or perhaps he was impressed by an image as banal yet eye-catching as this German advertisement for sewing machines. <laughs> of course, the, um, the background of that particular image is the other side um, of the bridge. So it's not on the Karako side, but it's on the other side. We don't know. Yet whatever his approach, contemporary photographs of the Galata Bridge confirm the accuracy and meticulous care with which the artist rendered each detail from the ironwork to the timber decking um, of the pavement. Fortunate to have access to the actual painting rather than forced to rely solely on a grainy reproduction, we can zoom in uh, to have a closer look at the fleeting moment before us. Look at how Hagopian has utilized narrative gesture to communicate the state of the mind of the four, the state of mind of the four men, and especially as a central figure um, to the right of the image, to the viewer. The intense concentration on the man's um, of the man's three fellow Hamals. Um, Hamal is a porter, hanging on his every word uh, makes a sense of tension palpable. Yet um, with the deafness of his brush, stroke, brush strokes, um, Hagopian has skillfully captured the slightest movement, the questioning gestures of the speaker's hands mapped by um, the protrusion of a web of silver blue veins or his open palm revealing a calloused hand, each packing emotionality and charge to the atmosphere. Hagopian offers us visual clue after visual clue. The sweat on the man's brow, his red sunburnt neck, um, the crudely patched um, dirty rags riddled with holes, the thick woven homespun rustic socks, certainly the handiwork of a loved one in his home village. Hagopian has added layer upon layer of meaning, rendering the experience of the backyards, the bantorts, and bringing um, to life a, word of, a world of poverty and migration, years of relentless toil, and hardship far from family and rural homeland. Um, backyard means unmarried men, um, and Bantort is, is, is basically, they, they were the migrant workers who uh, traveled from Ottoman Armenia to Constantinople, and a lot of them worked as Hamas supporters. Um, a lot of the people who were actually, the men who were called backyards were actually married, but uh, because they lived um, alone in Constantinople um, in slums, they were basically called backyards. So where does Hamas on the bridge at Karakoy fit into Hagopian's prolific output. It is a work of terrific skill, meticulously put together. We don't know when it was painted. My suggestion is that it would have been painted at some point around 1905 or thereafter. Um, there is um, a little blob between the two heads, which might suggest that's the um, Ingilis Hastanessa, which was built around 1903, 1904. So if that is the Ingilis Hastanessa, then we could sort of date this painting from around 1905 or thereafter. So we, don't, we do not know who the men are. Why is the painting captioned Turkish Hamas on the Karakoy Bridge and differently everywhere else? And of course, this could actually lead this discussion to a completely different direction, but we don't want to go there right now. Such a work was clearly fashionable at the time and would have appealed greatly to the ethnographic sensibilities of the Constantinople a la Franga bourgeoisie and foreign visitors alike. Such paintings of street types, among whom the Hamal of Constantinople had become an iconic figure, were associated with so-called 19th century Orientalist painting produced by Western artists. Local Ottoman artists too, among whom Ottoman Armenian artists dominated the commercial scene during, and at least to the end of the late 19th century, produced large numbers of such works, which, aimed, uh, which were aimed as souvenirs for travelers and tourists, but also for the homes of the local bourgeoisie. 
Hagopian produced scores of such images of very quality. So these paintings that you see before you um, are more often than not hastily executed works and often rather slapdash, lacking any emotional depth. And from where uh, the technical care with which Hagopian lavished upon the Hamals on the bridge at Karakoi are, are entirely absent. These images were mass produced again and again, copied from photographs and postcards, such, such as the example of the painting of the beggar, um, the beggar on the, at the end here um, that follows. We can clearly see here that Hagopian's painting is based on a photograph of a beggar standing against a wall and a window with a metal grill by the studio of the Ottoman Armenian Abdullah Frez. Of course, he's not the only one to use the same photograph. You can see that Trebizond-born uh, artist Ashak Fetvajan has also, among many others, utilized the same photograph for his paintings. There's so many examples of this particular photograph that has been copied as a painting. These artists often produced multiple copies of these images, especially if they did sell and were popular. See, for example, um, uh, the two known versions of Hagopian's Beggar Woman from Van, one dated 1889, that one's dated 1889, and the middle one is dated um, 1908. And of course, I would argue, looking at these images, um, that these images and the highly accomplished and dated portrait of a Hamal from Mush, um, which is the one that you see on this side, um, whilst utilizing the same tools of ethnographic realism as many paintings of street types, with their explicit references to Van in Ottoman Armenia, to Van in Mush in Ottoman Armenia, open up entirely new questions. Most certainly, the portrait of the Hamal from Mush is not an image of an exotic street type. What is the relationship of such works to the image of the Hamals on the bridge at Karakoy reproduced in Teotic? Unfortunately, time constraints prevent, prevent me from veering into that direction as well, especially as I need to be fair and give equal weight to the text of Teotic's biography of Simon Hagopia. As a bridge, however, to the second part of our look at, um, the, at the Teotic's biography of Hagopian, I shall very quickly turn to the, lat to the later part of the text reproduced in 1912 that lists 14 of the artist's most notable works. A mere glance at the list as compiled by Teotic reveals a staggering diversity of subjects tackled by the artist. These encompass academic landscapes and urbanscapes. And he basically names all these paintings, a view of an old Turkish street, Said Mehmet Pasha's mosques, three and a half centuries old medrese, the Selam look of Sultan Aziz in Ortaku, etc. Portraiture, portrait of the artist's father, official portraiture, portrait of the current Sultan Mehmet VI, the fifth, street types um, and ethnographic realist paintings, such as a poor Muslim, a poor beggar woman from Van, etc. And finally, official history and war painting, six scenes from the victories of Gaza Ahmed Muhtar Pasha. Even this limited compilation confirms Hagopian as an artist of considerable versatility and merit, albeit very much rooted in a late 19th century tradition of academic realist painting. Until the publication of Gary Kukman's magisterial two-volume compendium, Armenian Painters in the Ottoman Empire in Istanbul in 2004, Teotic's listing of these 14 paintings was pretty much the main source, if not the only source, available to art historians. We owe a great debt to Kukman for assembling and making available what is really his own visual archive in print and making accept, accept, uh, accessible to us the largest body of works known by Hagopian. 25 paintings in total. So he reproduces 25 paintings in his volumes. Finally, the Askeri Musea Siresim Kolopsiyono in Harbiya, Istanbul, that's the military museum in Istanbul, has probably the largest public collection of paintings by Hagopian. The 14 paintings are mainly of military subjects and include some of the works listed by Teotihuacan in 1912. Most paintings by Hagopian remain unknown, held in private collections inaccessible to art historians, but sometimes appear on the pages of auction catalogues, such as the painting of the dervish reproduced in Hagopian's obituary, published in 1922, which sold at Bonhams in London in 2006. So before turning to the text component of Hagopian's 1912 biography, allow me to whiz you through a rapid whistle-stop tour of the different types of works produced by Hagopian. So these include portraiture, portraiture and retouching, so that is a portrait of the, of the Sultan. And um, the, large, um, in, uh, the, the, the large portrait is, is um, the portrait of the 
of the Sultan being taken to the Harbia Military Museum. Religious painting commissioned by the by various Armenian churches, and there there's a uh, there's a, a notice of a blessing of a Simon Agopian painting in in one of the Samatia churches. Military paintings. Um, the one on this side is particularly interesting, and it was drawn to my attention by um, uh, a Turkish art historian, Gizem Tongo, who's um, discussing this work in her own work, and it shows um, it's quite a sort of romantic. Um, nationalistic portrayal of, of two Turkish soldiers de defending the, the, the Ottoman fatherland. And it is particularly interesting because this was painted by an Armenian artist during the very years of the genocide. So that in itself sort of, you know, opens up other questions. And it is shown in a room at the military museum um, directly behind where Talat Pasha's sort of bloody shirt after being shot by Solomon Talibian is displayed. So there's a distance between the, the, the painting and Talat Pasha's sort of shirt. But again, that's that's another discussion. And I think Gizem would probably do a better job than me in discussing it. And finally, um, small scale sort of souvenirs and tourist paintings. So this whistle stop tour ought to provide a window into the world of native Ottoman commercial artists and how they engage with their cultural, economic and political environment in the dynamic and competitive art market that was late Ottoman Constantinople, and in competition with photography, adhering to the rules of the market was a necessity for the commercial artists if they were for commercial artists if they were to survive. This could mean the production of portraiture or such representations of an exotic and timeless Orient with its landscapes and its inhabitants that would appeal to visitors and locals alike, souvenirs or decorative canvases for the Alafranga home. The retouching of photographs, church patronage, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The bewildering array of subject matter present in Hagopian's oeuvre um, reveals the flexibility with which the artist had tailored his work to target and respond to market demands. But this also explains the variation in the quality of the works produced. Indeed, a glance through Hagopian's known work often raises doubt that they were executed by the same hand. Let us now um, move to um, Teotic's biography of Simon Hagopian. As mentioned at the beginning of the talk, um, the um, biography follows a certain formulaic structure, artist's state of, and place of birth, his education, art training, a list of his notable works, awards, and closes with a quote by the artist. When reading the Teotic's text, several threads that can lead us down towards trajectories, each with their own complexities, we have already glanced um, at the list of Hagopian's notable works as presented in the biographical text. Due to constraints of time, again, I shall mainly focus and expand upon only one of them, the artist's education and art training, to give you a taste as to how to utilize the above mentioned proverbial bare bones by reading them alongside other contemporary sources and, and, and reflecting about context. So we learned that Hagopian was born in Samatya in February 1857. During his lifetime, this was and still is to a considerable degree today, an Armenian populated working class district right next to the also Armenian populated Kumkapi area where the Armenian Orthodox Patriarchate was and is still located on the shores of the Marmara Sea in the European part of Constantinople. No reference is made to the artist's parents or family except him being described as a son of severely impoverished parents, Chikavod Zanok Hizabag. The biography notes that Hagopian had recently had received his elementary education at the Khorenian school in Naulakapu, followed by the Holy Sahagian school in Samatia. All this information bears on his art education and training. As a nine-year-old child, having demonstrated a great gift for drawing, Hagopian had been granted permission by his art teacher, the prominent artist Telemak Exergian, to attend drawing classes with his most advanced students. Following a year of classes, the young Hagopian is also allowed to correct the work, the works of students for which he was paid. Of course, this would have been welcomed at home, where otherwise art lessons might have been viewed as frivolous. After school, he went on to receive private tuition from Exergian at his atelier on Feridia Street in the upmarket district of Pera, also on the European side of Constantinople, populated by mainly Westerners and Ottoman non-Muslims at the time. The reverence for Exergian is palpable throughout Teotic's text, where he's referred to as Hagopian's master, Barbet. This reflects onto societal norms of the period where deference towards one's elders was rigidly prescribed, non-adherence to which would cause offense. 
The term informs on their hierarchical relationship as that of master and apprentice, Ashkert. From the above information on Hagopian's art education emerges a picture of formal and informal art education systems coexisting in mid to late 19th century Constantinople. Hence, alongside an art instruction system, at least in non-Muslim schools, is revealed a parallel informal system of selection and conscription of talented pupils like Hagopian into apprenticeship with established artists such as Exergia. Dig a, uh, dig, a bit, uh, dig a bit deeper and an entire genealogy of instruction is exposed. Hence, we find that Hagopian's teacher, Exergian, was himself taught by another respected Constantinople artist, the above mentioned Abraham Sakayan. And of course, we know this because um, a few pages sort of um, ahead of Hagopian's was a biography of Sakayan, which basically gives us this, this information. Whereas Sakayan himself had studied with court painter Hovanes Umet Beizad, and so on and so on. The existence of such unregulated or semi-regulated networks of apprenticeship in the workshops of native artists, some locally educated while others trained in Italy or France, opens a window into how local artists were trained long before the establishment of the first Academy of Drawing and Painting, Académie des Dessins et la Peinture, by the French artist Pierre Désiré Guillemet in, in Pera in 1874, or the setting up of the Imperial Fine Arts School, Sanai Nefisemek de Bialisi, in 1881, by the French educated administrator and artist Osman Hamdi. Such information challenges official Turkish art historiographic views that claim that the genesis of Western style oil on canvas art education in the empire had begun at the Imperial School of Naval Engineering in 1795. And that during the early 19th century, and I quote, the establishment of courses on naturalistic painting in military schools was at a time when no painting classes existed in civilian schools and society's attitudes towards painting and painters was less than favorable, end of quote. That's by a nationalist Turkish art historian. This is of course clearly false as it ignores the instruction of non-Muslim artists by masters in their private workshops that can be dated at least to the mid 18th century. Highlighting the differences between artistic and technical drawing taught at these state institutions, the art historian Wendy Shaw has rightly pointed out that while approved in 1795, artistic drawing and painting was only instructed in the, in the engineering school from 1847, decades after its establishment, whereas Ottoman non-Muslims had already begun to adopt secular painting at least a century before, and we're not even sort of discussing um, sacred um, sort of picture making. The establishment of the Imperial Fine Arts School, um, which began to accept students in 1883, in effect revolutionized the face of fine art instruction, painting, sculpture, and architecture in the empire. According to the biography, Hagopian had enrolled at the Fine Arts School after Exergian's emigration to the United States, either in 1883 or 1884, and graduated in 1888. That would make him at 27 on enrollment and 31 upon graduation, significantly older than his fellow students. For example, his other classmates are Shakbet Bajan, Vichen Aslanyan, no relation of yours probably, um, Giovanni Della Tola, Shefket, and Galeb were significantly younger. Teotic's biography confirms that Hagopian had been one of the school's earliest graduates in 1888 with a large scale Mezatir graduation piece, which was awarded first prize and was later purchased by the French architect Alexander Valori, a teacher at the school. In the absence of diaries, letters, and other documents, Hagopian's years at the school are difficult to piece together. Contemporary newspaper sources do not mention Hagopian as a student in the fine arts school in 1884, 85, or 86. Meanwhile, much of the available information is confusing. For example, the first mention of Hagopian at the school appears on 19 September, 1887, when Arevelk, the popular um, Constantinople Armenian uh, reformist newspaper area about this Simon Effendi as one of six graduating students alongside Ghalib Effendi, Chef Ketbey, Fedvajan Arshag Effendi, Vichen Effendi and Giovanni Effendi, that's Giovanni Effendi, in the category of painting. The report confirms that the assigned subject for the graduation painting was a depiction of various parts of, uh, of a particular mosque in oil on canvas. This appears to be the same work included in Teotic's list of, list of Hagopian's works, for which he writes he was award, awarded a first prize. 
After, the, after their exhibition, all six paintings would be offered to the Sultan, that's Abdul Hamid II. The awards were published in Arabelk on the 25th of September, 1887, reporting that four students had achieved the first prize and two, including Hagopian, were awarded the second prize. Hagopian's name reappears among the list of graduates the following year, in 1888, as mentioned by Teotik. On the 18th of November, Arabelk reports that the other day, this year's examinations at the Bolis Fine Arts School, having been completed, produced the following result, which is then published in the format of a list with no added comment. In the list, the subjects are divided into five categories, architecture, sculpture, oil, pa oil painting, drawing, as well as a preparatory category. Hagopian's name appears under the third category, oil painting, Yuraner, alongside four of his five classmates, who had also appeared in the 1887 list. The subject of the painting is not identified in the text. In the list, the two, um, two of the graduate students, Vichen and Ghali Befendis, are awarded first class prizes. Um, of the rest, Jean de la Tola, that's Giovanni de la Tola, was awarded the first class prize, whereas Simon and Chefke Defendis achieved a second class award. Immediately following the list appears the announcement, the above mentioned gentlemen are this year's first, use the word, with the word Antlanic graduates. While the sentence is confusing, it suggests that these were the fine arts school's first ever graduates. And other information also suggests that they were in 1888. There is, however, a rare first-hand account that can be read alongside Teotic's biography to shed some light on Hagopian's years as an art student. In an article by his fellow student and friend, Ashak Vetvajan, published in the Constantinople Daily, Arabelk, um, on, in May 1888, Fedvajan describes in some detail the former, the former's financially desperate situation and provides a glimpse onto the challenges he was encountering. Without naming Hagopian, Fedvajan notes, in the fine arts, and I quote, in the fine arts school of Bolis, I had for three years as friend, classmate, a talented young man. That young man, even before any hair had sprouted on his chin and face, had been forced to exhaustively take the care of all the members of his family upon his person. He came to study for three days out of the week so that he could give lessons running between various villages of Istanbul, um, heaving and breathless, making it by the skin of his teeth. He ran and ran, exhausted and wasted, drenched in sweat for eight years and is still running." End of quote. The, the unnamed student artist referred to is beyond doubt, uh, Simon Hagopian. Um, Fedvajan only had two Armenian classmates. The other one was Vichen Aslanian, who was of considerably uh, better financial means. This thinly veiled reference to Hagopian confirms Teotic's mention of the artist's um, challenging family circumstances. While we have no means to gauge Hagopian's reaction to this artist, uh, to this article, humiliation perhaps, or the faint hope that his struggles would come to the attention of a patron, uh, had Fedvajan sought um, Hagopian's permission uh, before he published the above lines, we don't know. It is beyond doubt that these would undoubtedly have come to his attention. Petvajan tells us that Hagopian had already begun to teach even before enrolling at the Fine Arts School at some point during the 1870s. He shares a vivid account of the sacrifices made by Hagopian to be able to study just three days a week, unable to devote himself entirely to his studies due to his teaching commitments. Such detailed knowledge would only have come through a certain intimacy and friendship between the two men. As yet, I have found no correspondence or any other kind of documentation to indicate this friendship. There is, however, a single image, a group photograph of the teaching staff and students of the Imperial Fine Arts School, probably taken between 1885 and 1887, in which both Hagopian and Fetvajan appear. In the picture, the teachers are seated in the front row with the students behind them. And most of the students have, not, have never been identified. We can see Hagopian considerably older than the other students, posing with his hand clearly visible, resting proudly on his lower chest, um, standing in the center of the second row, fifth from the left, right behind Osman Hamdi Bey, who sits there in, right in the middle, third um, from, the, from, from the left. I was only able to identify um, Simon Hagopian due to the theoretic photograph, otherwise we would have never known um, which one he was, even though he looks slightly older than the other than the other students. And an identified young man, I suspect Vichen Arslanian, has his left hand firmly placed upon Hagopian's left shoulder. You can see it over there. 
Fedvajan stands forth from the left with his head leaning slightly towards Hagopian. The men have um, turned ever so slightly towards each other, their body language indicating familiarity. Well, of course, in itself, this is no confirmation of intimacy. Nevertheless, thinking about the image alongside the tone, um, which we find in Fedvajan's article, their position in this group photograph would suggest closeness and camaraderie. What is clear to us, though, is that Hagopian had not been awarded a first, a first prize at the Fine Arts School, neither in 1887 nor in 1888, as Teotic's biography has claimed. Had his inability to devote himself to studying full time, as Fedvajan's article has indicated, contribute to his being awarded second class prizes in both 1887 and 1888, in contrast to most of his much younger and less experienced co-students. But more importantly, uh, it raises questions as to the authorship of Theotic's biography of Hagopian and its reliability. Published during the artist's lifetime and with Hagopian's knowledge, who was the real author of the biography? Was it Theotic or Hagopian? It was a joint effort. Teotic was famous for relentlessly and constantly soliciting works and biographies from his contemporaries for publication. I'm certain that Hagopian himself would have indeed produced the information for his own biography and perhaps use a chance to perhaps correct his own academic record, embellishing it somehow, somewhat, perhaps assuming it would go unnoticed as decades after the event had passed and published in a publication accessible only to Armenian readers. Furthermore, the Teotics would not have checked the information for accuracy, relying instead on Hagopian. So back to Fedvajan's recollection of his final conversation with Hagopian. And I quote, when he came to see me in order to wish me a safe journey, uh, Hagop, um, Fedvajan had won the uh, Prix de Rome and he basically moved to Rome uh, to study. Um, when the time had come for me to go to Rome, he was directing um, desperate glances towards our great Aras, the Effendis. I gave him one piece of advice. Whether he acted on it, I do not know. And I quote, um, it's a quote within a quote. The honorable benefactor Hagopian, when constructing the Samakya church, would at the same time, by certainly considering that a number of images would also be necessary to make the church complete, go to him and offer to paint um, that church's pictures and ask him in lieu of your work to send you for at least two years to Europe for the perfection of your art. End of quote. Whilst we don't know what, if anything, came of the above suggestion, we certainly do know, we have seen that Hagopian, well, um, we know that Hagopian never made it to Europe to perfect his, 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 to perfect his art. Meanwhile, we know that, uh, uh, and Teoti confirms this, and we have already seen evidence that Hagopian had executive commissions for Armenian churches. Writing decade, a decade later in his heartfelt obituary for Hagopian, Teotic notes that, um, these churches constituted the public spaces where Hagopian's work could be seen. And this was in 1922. I will stop here. Um, in lieu of a conclusion, I will only say that I could have easily devoted a similar amount of space to close readings of, for example, Hagopian's inability to go to Europe to perfect his art. And because of that, there was always a lot of snobbery on his painting. People sort of looked down on his work and, and, and dismissed it because he, unlike other artists like Surabian and Nishanyan, his contemporaries, they had studied in Paris or Naples or Rome, etc. So um, he was dismissed because he had never been to, um, to Europe. Or his move as an artist from working class Samatia to bourgeois Pera, that's another sort of thread that we could sort of follow. Or his career as an art teacher. Again, he was remembered as, as an art teacher as much as um, an artist, um, et cetera, et cetera. But that would basically mean talking for at least another three hours. And I don't think anyone would remain in this room if I still just carried on. So thank you so much for your attention. And I hope I haven't overspoken. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Bastian. Uh, we have lots of time for questions. Uh, we also have questions that we're going to be fielding on Zoom. Hasmi is going to be kind enough to host them. So there's no rush, but please, for those of you listening to this from out there, post your questions in the Q&A section, mm -hmm. I guess, and then we will field them. But in the meantime, I'll kick off the questions in this room with a couple of uh, quick questions for you. First, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. So the two questions I have are, the first one is that you mentioned the need to read contrapuntally 
the bare bone biography of Hagopian alongside other sources that complement and enrich and thicken our description and understanding of Hagopian's life. Absolutely. Uh, my question to you is, could you elaborate and say, give us a few examples of these other kinds of documents? Uh, I know you mentioned published accounts in newspapers, Absolutely. but is there anything unpublished in the form of archival material in the shape of letters, diaries, notebooks, the kinds of things that we I historians wish. call ego documents? For instance, does the National Gallery of Armenia, which has a vast amount of archival materials, including from Ottoman artists, do they have anything? So that's my first question. And the second question has to do with uh, perhaps getting a better understanding of, of the artist in question uh, on the basis of the kind of patrons and patronage system in which he was operating. Obviously, he seemed to be quite bare bone and poor himself, uh, reflecting perhaps his biography, but uh, did he have wealthy patrons? Did, they, did these patrons have any role in the outcome of his work? And um, lastly, uh, since I like triadic questions, uh, the last question, if you can remember them, and if I can remember them. I just remember them. I wish I had been with The third question I had has to do with, uh, uh, yes, the, the, the elephant in the room, which is the subject of his paintings, Hamas. If you could say a few things about the history of Hamals in the 19th century. Uh, who are these Hamals? They're mostly from Van. They're Armenian to some extent, to a large extent, perhaps. Uh, just a few words about the Hamals and whether this obsessive fixation on them in the minds of some of these artists had anything to do with a larger societal change that was going on in the Ottoman Empire. For instance, the rise of nationalism, the importance of ordinary people, the vox populi, that kind of larger um, backdrop that might explain why they were focused on for this kind of portraiture, if they were to the extent that they were focused on. I will, I will do my best to sort of so, answer your mm -hmm. questions in the order and and please sort of, you know, remind me gently if I sort of suddenly sort of don't remember one of the questions. So um, I wish I wish there were sort of archival materials, diaries, letters, etc. Um, in, in archives. Um, I have looked into the archives of the um, Literature Museum in Yerevan and the um, National State Gallery in, in Armenia um, and elsewhere, and there's absolutely nothing. Um, they don't even have a single painting by Hagopian um, in Armenia. It just doesn't exist. There's one file, there's a folder on Hagopian, which when I found, I got really excited. And I opened it and, and it was a, um, there was um, a handwritten sheet um, copying Teotik's biography of um, Simon Hagopian. Mm -hmm. And whoever was doing the copying was probably bored halfway through it because sort of, you know, they, they miss lines and they change things, etc. So there's basically absolutely nothing on Hagopian in, in, in Armenia. I've never been able to come sort of across anything. I have tried to sort of go sort of in a way, sort of in a different direction. And knowing that, for example, um, Ashak Fedvajan and Simon Hagopian were friends and um, they studied together, etc. There are 52 boxes um, in the Fedvajan font because Fedvajan is one of the two Ottoman Armenian artists that is recognized in, in, in Armenia and is accepted in Armenia. And his archive was shipped, if I'm not mistaken, in the 1940s from the US to Armenia. He was going to repatriate, but he passed away in the US. Um, and I managed to go through the first five. The other one, Teremizian? Teremizian's the other one. So, um, and, um, so I went through the first five boxes. Initially, they, the person who was in charge wasn't particularly um, interested in allowing me to look at Ashak Petvajan because um, I think she'd basically worked at the um, National Gallery since the birth of Stalin. And, and um, <laughs> so, and she basically published uh, a uh, little booklet on Petvajian. And when I asked to see um, the um, documents, um, she said to me, Fetvajiana Imana, there's nothing for you to look at in the <laughs> um, And this was the body language. And I explained to her that I was actually really interested in Fetvajian's sort of classmates and his years in Constantinople. And eventually, so we became really, really good friends. And she was 
she made really great musaler sort of um, dolma and so when i was working in the archives somebody was dolma would sort of land on my table etc so that was my experience of the archives apart from they wouldn't really want you to be there between um before 11 o'clock and um they basically wanted you to leave at two o'clock. I will never be allowed in these archives ever again after this, but I don't care. It has to be said. Um, and um, so it was really, really difficult. So in the time that I was allowed, um, I managed to go through five boxes of, of Fetvai Jan's letters, et cetera, et cetera. But there's another almost 50 to go through. And um, I haven't been able to do that yet, but I will return and hopefully they will allow me in. So, um, so most of the material that I found on, on um, Hagopian um, are published sources. Um, so especially in um, published in the Ottoman Armenian press, because um, he was particularly well liked by the um, realist generation, the Irabash Serund. And um, in a way, so I'm jumping from question to question, sort of, you know, um, because you talked about the subject. And um, even though he um, had to face the market and produce kind of work that would sell because he came from a poor family and he had to support his family. And um, he was also married at this time, he had children, et cetera. So um, he did produce sort of images which dealt with the issues that these um, uh, Irabash, these realist um, intellectuals were particularly preoccupied with, let's say from the 1880s um, to up to the mid 1890s. Um, and um, that was mainly Bantuk Tutun. Bantuk Tutun was, was a phenomenon of large scale uh, migration from um, Ottoman Armenia um, to Constantinople. And uh, my understanding of the presence of large numbers of Armenian um, sort of migrant workers, especially porters, is that um, even though it existed before, um, the Armenians, um, Armenian migrant workers uh, dominated the um, profession of porter. Um, after 1826, so after the Janissary Revolt and the Sultan's um, 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 uh, massacre of the Janissaries, um, the uh, Esnaf, the, the guilds of the Janissaries were allied to the Janiss um, of their porters, were allied to the Janissaries. So the Sultan asked the Armenian Patriarch to sort of organize um, 10,000 Armenian porters to come and, and, and fill in their shoes. So um, from 1826 until 1896, which is the Bank Ottoman, uh, Ottoman Bank um, event, after which um, Two days after that, within two days after that event, um, uh, Armenian porters were massacred. On the, between six to eight thousand Armenian porters were massacred on the streets of Constantinople. Um, uh, they were clubbed to death um, and buried in mass graves. And we know these graves where they actually exist today in Balakla Cemetery, etc. Um, so that period, um, the Armenian migrant workers from the Mush region dominated the Hamal um, trade. So that stopped in 1896. And um, so it's an interesting period because these migrant workers, in a way, presented the face of um, the woes of Armenia, poverty, um, uh, absence of uh, economic opportunities, lack of infrastructure, etc., cetera, um, um, on the streets of Constantinople. So, um, um, so the social reformist realists um, wanted to, um, in a way, get artists to become their allies and represent um, positive images of these um, hamals um, so that um, the Constantinople Armenian community wouldn't really look down on them. Uh, so um, Hagopian, some of Hagopian's paintings can be seen in that particular light. Um, the vast majority can't, but um, a painting like Hamal's on the bridge at Karakoy. I mean, that was painted after 1896, several years after 1896. So it is called Turkish Hamal's on the uh, street of, uh, uh, on the bridge of Karakoy. Um, but that was also, um, it was produced during the reign of Abdul Hamid II. So um, the term Armenian could not be used um, in the title and the caption of a painting. Um, there were instances where paintings of Armenian subject matter could not be displayed because of the subject matter that they um, that they sort of um, engaged with. So that is one um, that is one way of sort of thinking about this particular painting. Another way of uh, thinking about it is why would um, Hagopian uh, present um, 
those, the very men who actually massacred um, the Armenian porters and were given their jobs because um, numbers of, of um, uh, migrants were brought in from the interior and were told that if you um, kill the Armenian porters, their jobs will be yours. So, I mean, there, there, there's, I mean, this really, really opens a lot of, it takes the discussion to a completely different direction. So um, it was a completely roundabout way of, 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 of sort of going through it. And there was a third question as well. Third question was- Patriots. Uh, Patriots, yeah. yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, we only saw one particular side of uh, Simon Hakopi, and as I said, I could have talked about him for another three hours, maybe more. But um, he was very, very close to um, uh, the imperial family. He was the teacher of, of some of the princes and princesses, for example, he was the art teacher. Um, he had patrons among the Armenian bourgeois class, like um, the, um, the Gulbenkians, uh, for example. And um, there's a particular anecdote um, that uh, when Mrs. Virgin Gulbenkian passed away, um, the husband um, was so distraught that he approached Simon Hagopian and said, would you sort of paint a painting of the Madonna, because I want to donate this to the, um, uh, patriarchal church, but could you just make the Madonna's face look a bit like my wife, Bergin? So he does that, and the picture goes to Ormanian Patriarch for his approval, and he goes and he goes, this is a picture of Madame Bergin, we can't sort of have Madame Bergin as, as. Mm -hmm. so it goes back to Simon Hagopian, he has to sort of change okay. it, etc. So he had the patronage of, of the wealthy Armenian classes, of the Armenian church, he taught in at least six or seven Armenian schools, including the Berberian, the Mesburian, the Esayan, the Getronagan, etc. He taught in Turkish schools. He taught, he taught in Greek schools. Um, he had private um, students. Um, so, yeah, I mean, he did, he did enjoy the, pa the, uh, the, uh, patron, the, the, the patronage of um, a diverse group of institutions as well as individuals. And also some of the um, military paintings that he produced, for example, um, um, the family of a um, particularly famous um, uh, Turkish um, Ottoman um, general who had basically fought um, in the 1877-78 Russo-Ottoman War, asked Hagopian, for example, to copy um, uh, images of that particular war in which he was involved um, on really huge scale um, canvases. Um, and and um, that's exactly what he did. And we saw one of the images, um, uh, actually we saw two of the images, um, you know, when I was showing you the military images, these, these, these were among those. And um, they're, they're in the um, military museum. So yes, um, in a very long winded way, the answer is yes, he did enjoy the patronage, but he really did die. He, he died of consumption, absolute poverty um, in 1921. So, um, he really, really needed. Um, he didn't really have a strong financial sort of background. So I hope that. Thank you. It's a really nice. roundabout way, but no, in articulate. Really, really rich, rich response. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anybody else here? Any questions so far? Any? Uh, Anne, you have a question? I, I did, but if Daniel has one, we can throw. Oh, but, go ahead. Okay, uh, thank you so much for a fascinating lecture. I'm wondering about the range of materials he may have used. You mentioned mostly uh, oil on canvas. Did he use other modes of? Uh... Um, that's a great question. Um, he would have sketched in watercolor or in pencil. I've never, never seen this. I, I haven't seen a single one of those. Um, all in all, we basically know about maximum of about 45 to 50 paintings by Simon Hagopian, they're all oil, oil on canvas paintings. But Teotig in his obituary mentions that Hagopian had given him a print of the um, dervish painting. So it is quite likely that um, he also produced um, prints. Some of these artists also produced um, postcards of their images. And yes, I do have a postcard, which was actually published um, of a quite naive scene of Constantinople, which is sold as a, as a postcard. I think it was published by, um, a British sort of company and several Armenian artists and Ottoman Turkish and Greek artists did sort of send their images to these companies and postcards were published but we really really don't know we don't we don't have any of them 
And so the exist the paintings that are in existence are typically in private collections then? They're typically in private collections. I think the vast majority of his work are in private collections. I've been trying to find his family and um, we really don't know where they are. Um, someone said they basically moved to um, Canada, but Hagopian is just such a sort of common yeah, surname. Yeah. I mean, half the Armenian population of the world is called Hagopian. Apologies to the any Hagopians here. <laughs> but um, so it's, it's, I have not been able to find them, but you know, one day, you never know if someone's actually watching. Mm -hmm. If you're a Hagopian, please do get in touch. Thank you very much. So, yeah. And adding to that, um, again, so really digressing, but um, we, um, um, he's buried in this, in the Armenian cemetery, the Armenian Orthodox cemetery in Shishli. So when I was in Istanbul in 2016, I thought, okay, I need to go and visit him because he'd become such a big part of my life. And I really wanted to go and say hello, and um, as one does. And um, so I did, and there was absolutely nothing there. I, I went into the office and I opened the book and there was absolutely, I found the plot number, etc. There was a different family buried there. So I went back to the office and I said to them, well, where is he? And they said, well, he's there, but obviously his family stopped making payments. So what we do after a certain number of years, after 50 years, you know, we give the plot to another family, but he's still there. And I said, well, we must put at least a marble plaque. So, um, yeah. So, um, and uh, they said, no, I said, yes, eventually they did. So now he's got a gravestone. So if you go to Shishli Cemetery, you can go and say hello to someone. Sorry, I was completely irrelevant. Right. Fascinating. Um, there was something I couldn't uh, puzzle out on my own, so I'll ask for your help. Um, I know just vaguely uh, what realism means, so I wonder first if you could tell us realism and naturalism, what do these things mean in terms of painting? And then I have a question that um, if it's not intelligible, then I'll explain it kind of in a more convoluted way, but any anything that's sort of put down on paper, anything that's recorded uh, leaves particular things in and particular things out. And so I was thinking about realist painting. Um, what sorts of information does it reproduce? I figure that's easy to answer. But what sorts of things does one have to leave out when one is making that kind of painting? I couldn't figure that out. Um, and I wonder if you could help me. That's a very interesting question. I'll, I'll do my best to answer it. Um, realism and naturalism. I mean, realist, there's realism in painting with lowercase r, and there's realism in painting with capital R. So, um, you know, a realistic um, or, uh, depiction of, 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 of something is, is something, um, you know, a, a figure looks like, it's like a real life sort of um, figure. But realism with a, with a capital R has, has um, political and socialist connotations. So um, when we think of realism with a capital R, we think of Courbet, Gustave Courbet in France, for example. And uh, he's um, the first artist who um, started producing um, images of the subaltern and um, sort of people um, working in the fields as real people working in the streets rather than sort of, you know, with a romantic backdrop. There's actually nothing romantic in his depictions of these people. And, and um, sort of um, in the, their understanding in Constantinople was through writers like Zola and all the rest and realism and naturalism sort of are sometimes used uh, interchangeably, but naturalism was used much, much later. So again, it's naturalism with a lowercase n and naturalism with a, with a sort of um, capital N. But um, the term that we normally use here is realist painting. And um, the first Ottoman Armenian painting, uh, painter who uh, we know that um, was interested in, in realism, it was actually quite advanced in, in, in his years, it was Bedros Sarabian. And in the early 1880s, he started sort of producing images of um, Armenian beggars from Van and uh, Mushet and, and the Armenian girl from uh, Paraj from Bitlis. Um, but um, sort of, you know, there were sort of quite political sort of, um, sort of paintings. And the realist intellectuals like Arpiarian and Pashalian and, and all the rest sort of embraced this kind of work. The only thing with this particular Armenian, Ottoman Armenian manifestation of realism is that it's got this very strong undercurrent of um, romanticism. So um, it's almost like an oxymoron, sort of, you know, it's realism, but 
it may be read sometimes as, as an allegorical image. So the real and the allegorical sort of, um, they don't really really make sense together, but um, within the Ottoman Armenian context, they do. And the example I'll give you is Bedro Serabian's really famous Armenian, um, uh, Armenian beggar from Van. And he's used every single tool, um, you know, uh, available to the realist artist. And it's, it's a, it's, I, I wish I had the image with me, but it's, it's a, it's in the National um, Gallery of, of Armenia in Yerevan. Um, and um, so you look at the painting, it's, it's a realistic portrayal um, of um, a man um, on his, uh, on his stick and he's sort of looking with sort of sad eyes at you and okay it's a realist depiction with a lowercase r but the realists with a capital r sort of embraced it but um then you read reviews of it and someone basically bursts into tears in front of it and saying oh this is all about the suffering of armenia and all the rest and you've got to think that um you've got to remember that it was painted at the time of the great famine of armenia in van in 1881 after the Russell um, Ottoman War, etc. So um, in a way, the use of the term van in the caption of the painting was a political sort of thing. So all these notions, realism, naturalism, are not really clear cut. And sometimes, you know, they, they sort of have a way of sort of blending or bleeding into each other. So regarding what you uh, what they sort of um, could portray in the image and and what they would sort of leave out um the first thing that comes to my mind is is censorship and just like you have sort of censorship uh, for printed documents etc you also had censorship of images so um and images were not freely exhibited um in the ottoman empire and for example in 1882 1884 the armenian beggar from van was shown on the grand rue de pera in a shop window the armenian girl from uh, Paresh was shown in the shop window. But fast forward to 1890 and the huge, huge two meter by one and a half meter painting by Nishanyan of an Armenian um, wedding in Mush, um, which is a sort of celebratory um, sort of image of an Armenian wedding, it's ethnographic sort of imagery, etc. It could not be shown because 1890, it was the time when, um, for the first time, um, uh, violence uh, uh, sort of uh, spread onto the streets of Constantinople with the Kumkapa sort of event and the Hunchak demonstration, basically. So um, the conditions were not right for it. And the word Armenia had been banned. So um, at least from 1888 onwards, you don't really see the word Armenia. I mean, it's not the only term, Macedonia as well. I mean, these were banned geographical terms. So I believe that you can actually get away by sort of putting content in paintings that you could possibly not sort of write or publish um, in that sensorial environment, because all you need is for the censor um, to just look at it and just see just a beggar but then again, sort of, you know, um, someone else might see a completely different content in that. So it's not really just who creates the image, but who looks at it and how, how it's received. And also circulation is another thing. So does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, one question you mentioned about some uh, influence or interaction between intellectuals. Uh, uh, have you pursued uh, uh, connections between uh, Hakopian and writers, especially because they should have known each other through Getronagan and Berberian, all Armenian writers, well, but many Armenian writers worked at those schools and they should, they, they were colleagues. Uh, is there any documentation or letters or mentions of him by? Absolutely, absolutely. And um, the only thing, I, I mean, the main thing I will, I will sort of point out is RPRian. He was begging, he was, he was asking Armenian artists of Constantinople to go to the hunts, to go to uh, the streets and, and, and uh, sort of uh, create sketches and paintings of the Bantos, etc. Because, as he wrote, um, he saw um, the work of Armenian painters as allies of the work of these realist social reforming reformist intellectuals. So um, I remember one of the presenta first presentations I did at Mesa was thinking about Melchon um, Gurdjian, Herant's Letters of the Bantort, 
and some of those sort of Hamal images and how they sort of interacted with one another. So absolutely. And um, these intellectuals did go to the ateliers, to the workshops of these artists. And we have several articles sort of describing these ateliers and, and the artists' works. And, and they engaged with one another. They knew each other. They were friends. Of course they were. They're basically part of the same sort of um, milieu. So um, yes, very much so, very much so. But no specific mentions of him or... Uh, Arpiayan, Pasharyan, uh, uh, they, they, yeah. they, they do, they do, they do, they do. So, and you find these in on the pages of mainly new, two newspapers, Arevelk, and after that, 1891, Hyrenik. Um, so, I'm going to dovetail uh, on Agok's question um, and ask you if, since you brought up circulation as well, uh, obviously, the little I know about Armenian art history from this period. Uh, tells me that some Ottoman Armenian artists, such as Terlemezian, for instance, crossed over to uh, the Russian side of the frontier, and they, particularly after the uh, the genocide or during the genocide, and they collaborated with local uh, Russian Armenian artists there, or Georgian Armenian 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 artists, Surenians, obviously, um, um, the great artist from Arostov, Nadonu, Nornachichevan, Sarian, and so on. So, did this, did Agopian, was he in the same league to be able to do that? Or was he not quite, did he not quite make the cut? Or was he not interested in collaborating or working with Armenian artists on the other side of the frontier? Is there anything, again, I know your answer is going to be, uh, I'm pressing you hard because you don't have much of an answer because you won't have, I suspect, because your sources are uh, secondary or primary sources uh, published. And so without the, the archival itself, paper trail... The paintings themselves but, are primary sources. So of course. Okay, you're right. Yeah. So it's not but, but the painting can only tell you so much so about much. social relations between individuals. Okay. So do you have any uh, anything to add to that in terms of collaboration, connection, circulation? Uh, and so on with artists uh, who were contemporaries, important artists. Ivo Zorsky was also a contemporary. Did these people know each other? Were they moving in the same circles? Were they utterly uh, barricaded from each other and so forth? It's a huge question. It's a, it's a really, really huge question. So, you know, the simple answer regarding sort of Simon Hagopian and, and Russian army and artists is no. Um, and there's certain reasons for that, and I'll, I'll return to that. But um, you mentioned the genocide and how some artists basically moved to um, Russian army, et cetera, and the Transcaucasus. But there was absolutely nothing new there. Sort of, you know, after the 1890s massacres, um, for example, in, from 1894 and to 1896, um, a very large number of Armenian artists left Constantinople, some of them never to return, and some did move to Russian Transcaucasia, Tiflis. Garabit Nashanyan is, is a case in point, and he exhibited in the Transcaucasus, and he received several commissions to sort of, you know, um, produce images for Georgian churches, which co caused outrage because, you know, how can you use an Armenian artist to sort of um, do paintings in a Georgian church? So, um, you know, um, artists like um, Dikran Yesayan um, and, and, and Garabet Nashanyan and Bedros Sarabian, they all sort of fled Constantinople. Um, but going even before that, you mentioned Ivozovsky. Ivozovsky died in 1900. Yeah. So, um, but Ivozovsky was, was a superstar. And Ivozovsky went to Constantinople um, at least six times. Mm -hmm. And he was very close to the Balians. And he would stay with the Balians. And the Balians would invite a lot of these artists, um, including um, Bedros Sarabian, etc. And um, you know, dozens of Armenian artists would get together with Ivozovsky. And Ivozovsky is said to have been very, very generous with them. Um, for example, Bedros Sarabian was called Kuchuk Ivozovsky by um, Sultan uh, Abdul Mejit for example, which is very interesting because um, Slavian never painted any seascapes whatsoever. So the notion of Ivozovsky, basically, Ivozovsky means an amazing painter. So um, so they did have a relationship. And don't forget, Ivozovsky was a Western Armenian speaker, and these people were Western Armenian speakers. Some um, other artists, like, um, if I'm not mistaken, Arsen Shabanyan and Vartan, Mah and Vartan Mahokyan, one from Ezrum and the other one from um, Trabizon, did travel to Crimea to meet Ivozovsky. So, and of course, 
they became seascape painters mostly. So um, there is there is a lot of interrelation between a lot of these artists, um, but it's not necessarily about caliber. I mean, Ivazovsky was in a league of his own, but um, owning an Ivazovsky was basically owning a Gucci bag. So it was a prestigious kind of thing to have. Ivazovsky just mass produced the same thing again and again and again and again. That's basically what he did. And as the art world basically moved forward, Ivazovsky basically, we say Derkai in Armenian. So um, Armenians want to think and Russians want to think that he's a major figure in the arts, but he's outside Armenians and, and Russia. He's not really, really that huge. So, um, but he was a superstar in his lifetime and people really, really sort of paid huge sums of money for his Ivazovsky, work. but he came to the US to the... Uh... To the Colombian exhibition. Yes. And, but a lot of the paintings that he brought with him were not sold and he basically donated some of them and he was really disappointed that they were not sold. So um, we look at Ivazovsky with sort of rose tinted sort of glasses. And yes, he's a very important painting um, as a Russian uh, painter, as, as a Russian artist, but, um, and also um, he's produced some very interesting paintings um, that talk to the Armenian reality of the time, particularly um, during his um, later period. Um, so, um, but he was admired and a lot of these artists respected him hugely and he was generous to them. Um, so there's a lot of interrelationship. Panos is a different story. Panos um became an artist quite late in life. He was a Vanetzi and he was imprisoned. He ran away from prison. And um, it was Khrimian Hayrik who funded, who was a distant relative of Khrimian Hayrik, who funded him to go to um, uh, France, if I'm not mistaken, or Italy, France, to study. And um, then after the fall of Abdul Hamid II, he did come back to Constantinople and he had a great relationship with some of the um, rising um, young Ottoman artists. Um, they had really, really good friendships there. And for Telemezian, um, he did not cross um, into Russian army during genocide. He was actually in the Van region and he was traveling around the region doing sketches and paintings and all the rest of Akhtamar. And sadly, most of them were destroyed or lost uh, during the genocide, during the self-defense of Van. And um, the wonderful uh, painting of um, the mountain of Sipan from uh, Gadut Island, um, which is in the National Gallery of Armenia, um, is one of the very few images of that time that basically survived. So he was in Van during the self-defense. And you know he retreated onto the Russian, um, uh, beyond the Russian border afterwards. And he was also working in Tiflis, right? He was working in Tiflis. He was among yes. yes, and that was there was sort of you know during the first uh, during the first World War period, um, and they included the um, another great um, Ottoman army artist, Sakis Khachadurian, um, and it was Tevlemezian and Khachadurian were the two important. Ottoman Armenian artists were really involved with the Tiflis group of, of, of artists. And of course, they organized exhibitions in Constantinople during the armistice period. So and this was to raise money for um, orphans, etc. And um, so, you know, all these artists did actually show together. Now, um, you know, you can make sort of value judgments as, as to who was a good artist or who wasn't a good artist or sort of, you know, uh, regarding quality, but, um, a lot of these artists did know each other. Um, I will come back to Simon Hagopian here. And my understanding is that because he was always economically in a sort of precarious kind of position, he did not really want to sort of rock the boat. So he kept his head down and he basically worked as a teacher, he worked as an artist, and um, I have never come across any political sort of manifestations in his work. Um, I mean, the thing is, of course, we don't we don't have access to letters or diaries, so we really don't know what he was what was he was thinking. But um, I guess what I'm trying to get at is that if these other artists have their archives in various locations, and very few, very few, including in Armenia, like letters and so on. Uh, I recently um, I PDF'd a copy of Ivazovsky's archival materials that include a ton of materials in in Armenia as well. Yes, and yes. So my if there are such letters, epistolary archives, printed or in archives yeah. of other artists with yes. whom your artist had, um, it, uh, had an intersectional relationship, 
societally, socially mm -hmm. speaking, you would think that he might show up in these archives or letters of his might be in those archives. Have you looked at that? I have never. Of course, of course, of course, I've never come across any sort of letters in any, I mean, I started looking at Petvajan, of course, you know, there's another 50 boxes to get through. So who knows what will come up a sort of, you know, if they're friends, I think Petvajan is probably the safest option. But regarding sort of, you know, what these artists actually thought and they worked each other, another of the greats is the engraver, Edgar Shahin, um, who basically um, moved to Venice and then um, moved, to, moved to Paris. And um, he, um, uh, had to exhibit his works in the Ottoman section uh, of the uh, Paris Exposition of 1900. So um, Turkish historian, for example, tells us that there was only one artist who represented the Ottoman Empire. There were, in 1900, in Paris, there were eight, six of whom were Armenian, and two of whom basically won gold medals. Uh, um, Sarkis Tiranyan and Edgar Shahin, and one of them won um, uh, an honorable mention, and that was Zakhar Zakarian. So all these artists did know each other. And we know, we have access to uh, letters that Shahin wrote to, um, to who was the um, editor of Anahit, uh, Ashak Chobanyan. Ashak Chobanyan, who basically, and he says, I was forced to exhibit in the Ottoman section. And I don't consider this an honor, especially after the recent massacres. Mm -hmm. So in answer to your question, I've really looked at the pre-genocide sort of period, and I haven't really examined the post-genocide uh, or immediate sort of, you know, post-war sort of period yet. Um, because I feel that um, the 1890s have not really been properly studied. And these artists are sort of really, really forgotten. I mean, we know about Serenian, who's an extraordinary artist. Uh, we know about Tevlemezian, we know about Ivazovsky, etc. But we don't know about the Hagofians and the Serabians and the Nishanians and the Levon Kyrgyans and the Sarkis Khajarurians, etc. And I could go on and on, who were really, really sort of highly regarded during that period. So. One question. Uh, we do have one question. On, our viewer is wondering if there are is any digital catalog that contains the works of these artists? Like you mentioned a lot today, where can they find their works if it's possible? Digital catalogs, um, not for Hagopian, not for Hagopian. Um, I would say um, the National Gallery of Armenia has done a wonderful thing and they've sort of digitized um, uh, quite a huge chunk of their collection mm -hmm. on their website so you can basically access them. So, um, and there's a search facility as well. You can type first, you can look at the names of the artists, click on them and they'll suddenly sort of, you know, produce all the images, et cetera, um, on, on the website. But apart from that, I don't really, I've never come across any, with the exception of auction sites like liveauctioneers.com and mutualart.com etc which um list all the works by these artists that have been sold at auction and there's several for example by simon Hagopian. so there, there, there was another way sort of, of 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 finding out about what kind of sort of paintings they produced so i hope that answers that thank you thank you so much awesome. thank you very much thank you you want some coffee? Thank right? you for your patience. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 <laughs>